Well, thank you, Kim, very much. And thank you, uh, David and Dragan and the other organizers of this great conference. I'm, uh, I'm really uh, you know, uh, impressed and learned a lot from the opening uh, uh, papers. Uh, so I will, I, I'm a little, this is a very focused paper on Ellison's Invisible Man, so some more, more modest uh, contribution, but I, I hope it will kind of connect with some of the other, other things that will be said at this conference. And at the uh, urging of the organizers, I will try to do what Sander did, which was to kind of speak it, not read it to you. Uh, but I don't know if I can do as good a job as uh, he did. That was really wonderful. Uh, and just kind of talking it out with great clarity and, and so forth. And I'll try to, I'll try to be brief, but I, I guess since there are only two of us, we're not quite as uh, pressed for time. Uh, but I'll try to keep it to the 20, 25 minute uh, format that we've been uh, given. I'll just give you a little contextualization for this. Uh, it is uh, this paper, it is a chapter in uh, this uh, book project, The Rediscovery of America, Multicultural Literature and the New Democracy. Uh, that title comes from, uh, is actually an echo, a very deliberate echo of Waldo Frank's book of 1928 entitled The Rediscovery of America. So I'm, I'm writing another one. If you actually check on the internet or Melville here, you'll discover that there are like 59 titles, The Rediscovery of America. So it's been used often. I hope I don't get sued by some living you know, uh, person who considers this his or her intellectual property. But at any rate, I think this will be a different book than Waldo Franks, but I'm an adm admirer of Waldo Franks. I started my career by being a, ch a, a channeling medium for Henry James, and, and now increasingly it's uh, leftists who have channeled uh, through me uh, like uh, uh, Waldo Frank. At any rate, the uh, book project is very uh, simple. It really says uh, literature is at its best a, uh, a, a discourse that allows us to theorize uh, social and communal and political uh, uh, models that are not available in current democratic or other uh, political uh, experiences. And so imagination becomes a way of working through a kind of abstract model and then testing it against uh, existing uh, uh, political horizons and so forth. So it's very simple in this regard. And it's also a kind of political gesture, going back to what Sanders said at the beginning of his talk, we talk, 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 and there's, you know, what's the payoff, what's the activism and so forth. My activism here uh, in this book is an effort to say uh, the multicultural uh, politics of the late 80s and early 90s are not or should not be over. There were limitations to those politics, but uh, the word multicultural and multicultural theory, or those words, do not suggest that we are at a kind of end of a certain liberal interpretation. There is another interpretation of multiculturalism that has a long history, uh, I contend, especially in this literary history I'm tracing, and uh, we should be taking more seriously. This book goes back to Martin Delaney in the 19th century, and it concludes with uh, Louise Erdrich and Maxine Hong Kingston uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, and so there's even 2000, actually, the very last text in this book is uh, uh, Erdrich's wonderful uh, recent novel, not her newest, but uh, her newest is The Master Butcher's Singing Club, which I also recommend, but uh, the last report in the miracles at Little No Horse, which is, I think, an extraordinary, extraordinary novel. At any rate, one of the aims of this book is also to be hemispheric, to be transnational in its uh, scope. And you'll hear in this uh, paper, uh, the description I give you of, of my argument, that uh, there is a, a criti criticism of Ellison for being too US-centric, for not taking into account or developing the international possibilities of his argument with regard to diversity. Uh, this is a kind of typical approach that I take. Uh, those of you who know me will recognize this. I begin by trying to respect the logic of the text with regard to its uh, argument, uh, in, in the case of this book, with regard to uh, diversity and multiculturalism and critique of racism and so forth. And then in the second half, I kind of lower the boom and criticize <laughs> the text for its uh, failures, for the, the horizon that is usually established by particular uh, historical uh, 
particular historical moment, in this case, 1940s and 1950s, which uh, Ellison was writing Invisible Man and its publication, and to a certain extent, its aftermath, and how that horizon then has to be uh, exceeded by other political strategies and, and uh, practices. The criticism, of course, is not meant to say, oh, well, you now can throw this book out of the, you know, take it off your shelf or the, the canonical list or whatever. Uh, certainly no critical criticism is going to do that with a great work like Ellison's Invisible Man, but it's not my intent. It's to mark the limitation and then to say, this is what is needed afterward, you know, what you have to do in the next historical moment. But it's also intended to create a kind of uh, uh, genealogy, as I would, I would call it, back to Foucault and Nietzsche and other figures who've all been, already been uh, invoked. All right, so I'll turn to the uh, argument, the first half of it being an effort to respect the logic of uh, Ellison's uh, argument in Invisible Man in 1952, and of course the years leading up to it when he was writing it, regarding uh, the contribution, uh, his contribution to a theorization of uh, cultural diversity. Uh, the uh, novel, I think, uh, moves very uh, uh, profoundly in that direction by suggesting that uh, African American experience uh, changes the conception of representation in U.S. democracy. It challenges the notion of using a word now that I find appealing in a recent collection, Materializing Democracy, edited by Russ Castronovo and Dana Nelson. They use the term representivity. It's kind of like governmentality. It's a term that kind of highlights this uh, issue. And the whole notion of representivity, I think Ellison, Ellison uh, raises in a kind of profound way in Invisible Man by suggesting it's a problem not only for African Americans, obviously it's been a political problem for African Americans in, in US history, but that that problem is also an opening for a new theorization of what we mean by representivity that always has to negotiate between some larger social uh, and political uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, a group or, or politics or legal system or institutions uh, and the specific identification of the subject with a, another group which is in some contestatory uh, uh, relationship. Of course, this is an elaboration of Du Boisian double consciousness and Ellison is very explicit about that uh, in, the, uh, in the novel, but it also involves, it seems to me, uh, very profoundly in the in, uh, Invisible Man, uh, it involves the recognition of different kinds of literacy so that the African American is faced with literacies that are overdetermined by print, the print archive and kind of the ideology of uh, Euro-American print that uh, excludes or at least trivializes, renders secondary many of the uh, crucial ways in which African Americans have uh, represented themselves communally in addition to print. We're thinking of dance and uh, street argo and uh, popular culture in a, in a widely conceived way, folk culture, lots of others that I try to talk about in the first part of this pa paper and which are brilliantly woven into Invisible Man. This is not to tell uh, those of you who know the novel well anything new. That's one of the great achievements of the novel of, of kind of weaving in these other literacies into a text which is part of the print, uh, the print archive and which profoundly challenges the print archive as a consequence. I realize that this conference is to a certain extent dedicated to a deconstructive proposition and so my, my gesture to deconstruction is at one point I say that Ellison deconstructs the Euro-American novel by precisely challenging that print uh, archive and I think that's still, Jacques you'll have to correct me, but I, I think it's still faithful to the concept of uh, concept and, and the strategies of deconstruction. But there are my, my comments on deconstruction end. Uh, and I move on from there to suggest that, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of that from the novel that I think you're, uh, you will remember. Uh, it's a, a sort of a crucial and visionary moment for the narrator in the novel when he sees three young men on the subway platform. They turn out to be uh, hipsters. They turn out that he refers at one point to them wearing styles of dress that he uh, actually connects with the zoot suit, uh, recalling the zoot suit riots here in, in Los Angeles in the, uh, in the 1940s during the, during the Second World War. Uh, but there's a couple of, and admires them in, in a variety of different ways as being these figures who are outside of history, outside of the 
uh, conventional modes of representation, and then himself identifies profoundly with these three young men uh, who are reading. They're carrying with them magazines, which on closer examination he recognizes are comic books. And they're, they're speaking a kind of hip street uh, jive and, and uh, connecting with each other in ways that uh, he clearly he envies. Uh, and on the other hand, he finds somewhat alarming because there's no way for them to be represented in the existing mechanisms of representation of the dominant culture. Uh, you don't at first know that they're African American, but a couple of paragraphs later he says they were black. So he does, he brings it back. So the reference, the possible link with the West Coast, zoot suit riots, with uh, you know, a Latino Latina culture, and with uh, all of the uh, kind of possible multicultural uh, dimensions of the book are in my view, at that moment, kind of lost, or they're, they're kind of brought back to a specificity uh, of the black-white binary, which will, I will turn in a moment uh, to my criticism. But it's an extraordinary moment, and it's an extraordinary moment that is clearly as powerful uh, as a Joycean epiphany or any of the visionary experiences of the great romantics or uh, of the moderns and, and so forth. Uh, it's a moment that I think uh, is linked uh, for the narrator and for Ellison in the rest of the novel with the effort to find a model of political representativity which will include these young man, men and their, and their exclusion and that, will, uh, that is uh, figured in the rest of the novel uh, for the narrator uh, in the uh, his, historical sort of uh, uh, status of Frederick Douglass. So that uh, there's a long discussion, as many of you know, about this uh, 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 Illust this uh, picture of uh, Frederick Douglass that Brother Tarp hangs on the wall of the, uh, uh, the Brotherhood's offices in Harlem, and a long discussion in the novel and reflection by the narrator of his tie to Douglass as someone who, instead of just writing his autobiography numerous times, connected his own subjectivity, his own uh, uh, identity with the problem of representing others. And Brother Tarp says several times, quite pointedly, to the narrator, he belongs to all of us. And he's, I think Brother Tarp is trying to teach the narrator something. You know, your political organization in Harlem uh, is going to have to, in some sense, follow that kind of representativity. And there's an extent to which uh, the narrator does, in fact, learn from Douglas and tries to incorporate in his own uh, brief celebrity as a representative of the Communist Party in Harlem and a representative of the African American community, a sense of identity that tries to incorporate these differences, this diversity. Uh, and of course, the epilogue to the novel uh, uh, deals exactly with that, the extent to which the narrator has come to understand that his double consciousness, his duality, is a key to a theory of diversity. Uh, a diversity that's not just specific to African Americans, but all Americans should have, uh, have in common. That's the first part of it, and I'm not uh, doing as good a job as I should in terms of representing the subtleties, intricacies, and the perfect coherence of my argument, but uh, uh, Ellison provides us with a model for diversity for all Americans drawn out of African American uh, experience. Uh, that could be representative and that challenges certain of the conventions of the modes of literacy that are uh, prevalent, certainly more prevalent in the 1940s and 50s than they are today in our, in our digital uh, age. In the last part of the uh, paper, I say as uh, appealing as this argument is, uh, there, the uh, limitations have to be uh, identified. Uh, if this is a theory of diversity, it's a theory of diversity that has to be uh, inclusive or has to engage uh, the other minority uh, communities in the United States. And there is a kind of strange uh, refusal of that multicultural gesture in Ellison's Invisible Man. For example, where are the Native Americans' uh, voices? I mean, even in that period, Faulkner, in dealing with the rural Southern culture, is bringing up the kind of residual traces and presences of Native Americans who have been excluded by the dominant uh, ideology. Where are the Asian Americans? Where are the Puerto Ricans? Where are the you know, other minority cultures that certainly belong to uh, the urban spaces as well as many of the rural spaces that figure uh, in, the, uh, in the novel. Uh, in, in short, the black-white binary 
doesn't live up to the promise of diversity that Ellison uh, offers in the novel. Uh, and that uh, encompasses as well two, uh, several other aspects. The representation of gender. Gender would be a crucial uh, feature of exactly this theory of diversity. And yet when we look at the representation of women in uh, Ellison's uh, uh, Invisible Man, we find real, uh, simply stereotypes. Not only stereotypes of the white women uh, who are uh, you know, sexually, who confuse their sexual, sexual desire for the uh, Invisible Man, with uh, the politics of the Communist Party. But uh, Mary Rambo, the, the uh, uh, African-American woman who runs the boarding house, is nothing but uh, you know, represents nurture and domesticity as an alternative to political activism. And uh, so uh, uh, gender politics are trivialized. If you'll remember, when uh, the narrator is uh, 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 sent, uh, kind of sent down from Harlem for being too powerful, uh, he's assigned to the woman question. Uh, and although it appears that Ellison is criticizing the Communist Party for its trivialization of uh, feminist politics, I'd argue it's really Ellison, too, who is trivializing and rendering, you know, sort of a subordinate the whole question of feminist uh, of politics. Uh, certainly, this is a problem in an anticipatory sense, since women's rights, the anti-war movement, civil rights would all be crucially, insofar as they're going to be powerful post-war political movements, they worked by coordination. And if they failed, they worked by division. So in that sense, there's a kind of problem in Ellison's argument. And there's also a problem of sexual uh, uh, identity as well. If you remember Mr. Emerson, the son of Emerson Sr. Uh, Emerson Sr. has that uh, elegant import-export firm uh, filled with the art objects of uh, the world. Uh, obvious critique of kind of high culture and culture vulturism, as it used to be called. But the young Mr. Emerson is clearly a gay male. Uh, and he, although he is, uh, develops a friendship with uh, the narrator briefly and exposes the lies of the dominant culture, uh, he's clearly trivialized uh, as well and made, made fun of in ways I won't go into with particular passages as well. So there's a particular uh, homophobia in Invisible Man, which is, uh, strikes me as, uh, as problematic. Much more important seems to me to be the rejection of a possibility of an internationalism, which increasingly uh, for Ellison in the novel is identified with a failed internationalism on the part of communism. Uh, of course, the Communist Party uh, USA, which he so clearly rejects uh, in the novel, but one that picks up the politics of internationalism in the African-American in African-American communities during the Second World War, which can be specified with respect to the service of African-Americans in World War II, and bringing home from World War II the experience of, on the one hand, fighting against various forms of discrimination, uh, you know, anti-Semitism, and returning to racism at home, and complaining about that, that being, in a sense, the infrastructure of a, uh, of a post-World uh, War II uh, civil rights uh, uh, activism. It's curious that Ellison takes that out of the novel. The 1943 Harlem riot, which is w the basis for, at least one basis for the Harlem riot that uh, concludes the novel, it's kind of penultimate action of the novel, was the result uh, of a uh, returning uh, African-American serviceman who was trying to protect his mother uh, and his wife from harassment by the police and who was shot by the police. Instead, those of you who remember the novel will recall that it's his friend, it's the Invisible Man's friend, Todd Clifton, who's you know, left um, the Communist Party and is uh, unaccountably selling these black Sambo dolls on the street, who is shot by the police. Why shift from that historically specific event of a serviceman facing the kind of contradiction between racism at home and fighting racism and discrimination uh, abroad in the Second World War. Why eliminate it? And the fact that Ellison reported the riot in uh, the New York Post, wrote a story on it, you know, readily available, and knows well exactly the events leading to the riot, makes me conclude that there was a deliberate effort to sort of take the international out of the, out of the novel and thus take out of it what today we would call the transnational politics. So this uh, is, for me, a considerable problem. I'll just add a note to that from the fine uh, biography Lawrence Jackson has 
uh, published last year in 2002, Ralph Waldo Ellison, The Emergence of Genius. He talks about large sections of the novel that were organized around Leroy's journal, the journal of a, uh, a black merchant marine uh, who had inhabited the boarding house, Mary Rambo's boarding house, before the narrator comes to live there. But he finds this journal, and in the original manuscript, he's reading the journal. Well, uh, Leroy's journal is very much the black radicalism of tr the transnational in the 30s and 40s. His hero is Nat Turner, not Frederick Douglass. Uh, his conception, Leroy's conception, is kind of guerrilla warfare against U.S. nationalism and colonialism. All of those sections were removed from the novel at the urging of friends and at the urging of uh, his editor at uh, Random House, uh, Albert Erskine. We could say, well, it's you know, technical cosmetic stuff that was done to the novel. But there's something about that ripping out of the novel this international dimension, which of course would echo Langston Hughes's The Big C and many other you know, writings that touch on the question of US colonialism, Richard Wright's critique of US colonialism. Where's the colonial critique in Invisible Man? So it's with that that I, and I'll just kind of draw that sort of conclusion, that the problem in Invisible Man's theory of diversity is it's too focused on a black-white binary. It doesn't take into account sufficiently the political uh, activist movements like the women's rights movement uh, and the internationalism of the anti-war movement. Of course, he couldn't have predicted these things, but doesn't connect well enough uh, with, with those movements. And it isn't sufficiently uh, attentive to the questions of transnationalism available to Ellison at precisely that moment. It's not that these are future events. They were very much part of the 20s, 30s, and 40s intellectual uh, history and political activism uh, of the period. Right? So I'll conclude with that, and thank you very much.